first quick introductions, I'm Dr. Amy Vanderbilt, I'm with TrendPOV.com. We're a social omnimedia, uh, which is sort of a business exercise for me. Uh, since leaving DARPA, I have a high-tech background and do a lot of technology scouting. Dan? Uh, my name is Dan Robles, I'm the uh, director and founder of the Genesis Project, and we developed something called the Value Game, which is, uh, it, well, social media is really great for talking to your friends, but we eventually have to get together and organize and build things together. So the value game starts with money, ends with money, but the value is created in social uh, currency, so to speak. I'm Joe Johnston, I'm CEO and co-founder of Connect.me, and we're a peer-to-peer -peer social reputation system. Hi, I'm Patrick Merck, uh, and I'm an attorney at Engage Legal, and uh, when I'm not wearing my attorney hat, I also do design and development work uh, with my company, Engage Strategy. Cool. All right, so um, a math geek, an engineer, a social media entrepreneur, and a lawyer walked into a room. <laughs> uh, let's, let's start with uh, what the new value movement uh, means to you, and just to mix it up, I'm going to start with Patrick. Well... <clears throat> That's a great question. Uh, so the, the new value movement to me is taking a lot of what was tangible, uh, uh, productive kind of uh, enterprise and moving it into the intangible kind of social online space and creating a framework for people to work together and exchange value amongst themselves and also to discover kind of hidden value for motivating people. Uh, I like to think that there aren't really lazy people, you just don't really understand what they value, right? And if you ha understand what people value, then you can motivate them better. Uh, and so discovering those things, that to me is, is a lot of what we're talking about here. Joe? To, to me it has a lot to do with the, similar to what Patrick was talking about, but the, the intangibles that are kind of locked up in people's heads. Um, traditional currency systems do a fantastic job for certain things, but because there's so much disruption happening in the world right now, which is both good and bad, it's certainly a lot of opportunity, but the traditional systems no longer really kind of uh, capture and allow people to interact and, and, and value each other's interactions uh, in the way that uh, sort of cash-based societies did previously. And, you know, from Certainly from our perspective, reputation is, is a huge one. It's something that really is kind of locked in people's heads. It's not something that you can just look at someone's bank account and say this person's highly reputable. Well, our, our, our platform is uh, it, it's more like if you were to look at our existing economy in, in terms of land, labor, and capital. Uh, the merchant class allocates land, labor, and capital in various combinations to produce everything we see before us. But we look now that land is now transcended through social media and, and um, higher technologies. Labor, when was the last time anybody did a labor unit? And capital is constrained by a dead economics. So we're finding that that, that that structure no longer articulates the value that does exist, that is being created, that is that people in communities are producing. So if you look at something like this microphone, uh, if I were to allocate intellectual, social, and creative capital instead of land, labor, and capital, I'd wind up with the same product or the same functionality in a product. So why not move to a system where, where social, creative, and intellectual capital are the basis of, of a currency? All right. And uh, if I had to put a definition on it, I see an industry shift. Uh, I track trends in the business environment, and this is certainly one that's happening. We saw this over decades. We're moving from a uh, manufacturing-based environment to an, an information economy to a knowledge economy. We're evolving now into something else, and this is what I believe that something else is. But it's at a very difficult stage where we're not quite um, prototyped yet. Trend, trends in your business environment tend to follow a very specific pattern. It's almost an Elliott wave for since we're in a financial room here. <laughs> then if you appreciate a good Elliott wave like I do, uh, we're not quite yet to sort of a first prototype stage of it, but we're starting to get there. So we're at a place where we can choose to define and choose to have a hand in the construction of what this will become, and I think that's pretty exciting. Um, so I, I've lined up uh, a flow, so Dan, Dan made the huge mistake of letting me moderate, so I've lined up kind of a flow of, of how uh, I want to sort of present it before we start getting the audience involved. So uh, I want to start with Dan and get a little further into how he sees this change in the industry environment happening. 
Um, so this shift from land labor capital to social, uh, intellectual, creative capital, uh, and some of the difficulties in quantifying that and monetizing that. Uh, and I want to definitely bring in the, um, the concept of social flights, okay. because I think that's a first step in, um, in attempting to work within this structure. So let's get a little deeper into that. Um, well, it's all nice and easy. To say, easier said than done, you could, you could probably imagine. And um, so all these ideas are easy to say, but to do, they, they're quite a different matter altogether. Um, I'm co-founder of a company called Social Flights, which is a ride-sharing system or platform for aircraft. And what the, the thesis there is that people can self-organize around a shared asset, the aircraft. You got three or four, three communities: the traveler interacting with the aircraft, the aircraft operator, which is a small FBO, and you get the community, the economic <coughs> development agencies of the community, all interacting with that asset, acting in their own best interest. In fact, preserves the asset rather than consumes the asset. Okay, in, in the process of that happening, a great deal of social capital is created. And we just, these are just generic terms because nobody's really nailed them down. Same thing with social currency. Nobody's nailed these things down, so we kind of, you know, luster on them. But the idea is that um, people would self-organize around assets. We'll put a smaller airplane in a community, and we're getting these small communities who are literally stranded from the airlines pulling out of the small, obviously on a CAPM model, there's no business there. There's no, nothing in there, so they pull their aircraft out. But when you add a value gain, that business, that business that was no longer viable now becomes very viable in terms of the social value that it creates. So we get these communities organizing around the asset. Starts with money, of course, you have to pay for fuel. Ends with money because you know, the traveler gets where they want to go, the operator gets paid, the community gets the economic development, but the value is created within the game. Um, that's deployed to the aviation community. We want to do the same thing with the construction community. In fact, we're bidding on a project for a 25-story a, a condominium where there's the remediation project is going on in the three, three communities which interact with that. I won't go into any detail, but that is um, very tremendously complex. Aircraft are tremendously complex. Those industries, um, so we're learning a lot, and uh, we see a shift in, in what has to be done to put these things together, and we're learning um, how to employ those, those shifts. Uh, one of the things we found is, and I'm sure Patrick will talk to his legal structure, is not in place for a social exchange. Um, we find that the tools for social exchange are, are not perfect. Um, some are guarded behind these gilded walls that can't be crawled by, a, by Google, and then there's Google. So we, we've got you know, some challenges there. So we're looking for new tools, and, and that's one of the reasons why I'm very excited to have, um, be speaking with this panel. All right. Joe, what does it mean to you? Well, before, before starting work on, uh, on Connect.me, I was working a lot with uh, a couple different nonprofits that were looking at kind of a, a deep historical perspective and then also a lot of future planning. And one of the things that came up that I found extremely interesting is some of the historical perspectives on monetary systems and what, uh, what some of the new systems that are sort of popping up now, they're actually quite old. So there was this interesting thing, and, and you know, please take this with a grain of salt because I'm certainly not an expert on this subject, but from my understanding, in, towards the end of the Middle Ages, there was uh, a consolidation towards central banking, and previous to that, uh, for, for quite a long time, there were essentially three monetary systems, right? Local, merchants and uh, a national or kind of a uh, you know controlled <laughs> centralized system and what, what happened is the, the merchant class was was starting to get so close to the uh, to the noble class and the noble class decided to kind of consolidate and and outlaw some of these these other currencies what was interesting is that that local currency had this really phenomenal um, value to it uh, that was essentially tied to grains and it was a devaluing currency so you, you take grain to the local granary, they would issue you a, essentially a ticket or receipt, and you go and tear off the pieces of that receipt and you know, buy a chicken with it. Or it was essentially sort of a barter system that devalued because your grain devalued, right? Over spoil and other things. So it only, that only was good for a year or two. Well, just recently, that was sort of reintroduced. So in South America, uh, and one of the nonprofits I was working with was doing a lot of work in Ecuador with one of these sort of new kind of currency barter systems. Because of so much fluctuation in, uh, in global politics and, and inflation and, and devaluation in local uh, currencies in, in Argent Argentina, Brazil, and Ecuador, they reintroduced these sort of barter markets. 
because money devalued essentially overnight for a lot of these people, they still had a lot of skills and they had a lot of needs, so they had doctors and other people, but they had no way of, uh, of exchanging value between each other. So they introduced these barter systems where they could go and on a local level, um, have with a devaluing currency, essentially exchange services. So it didn't actually replace the national currency, but it started to supplement it. And we're starting to see this happen in a, in a <coughs> few different places around the world. I, I think that's a really, really fascinating trend that's very much kind of tied to, to globalism and sort of these new value uh, economies. And then the other big sort of data point around this is um, the shift in, in labor markets. In the US right now, I, I think uh, just off of the recent tax returns, it was something like um, uh, a third or tw somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of US labor force is registering essentially as freelancers, right? They're, they have a 1099 uh, income tax. That's projected to go up to 50% <coughs> of the labor force by, I think it's 2020. That's, un, that's unheard of, right? And so this is a, a, a totally, this is the largest shift in labor since really kind of the beginning of the industrial revolution. And in order to accommodate this, you have to have all these sort of intangibles in place. What people think about each other, certifications, reputation, all these things have to be addressed in order to power this uh, this new marketplace. Yeah, and we're, we're going to have a lot of fun with the concept of influence, <coughs> reputation, and trust propagation here in a minute. The lawyer's um, going to tell us about that. <laughs> so <one>. now <laughs> let's hear it right now. Let's hear from from our resident lawyer. We're just going to pick on you today. Sure, yeah, yeah, please do. I mean, everybody <laughs> does. That's what he's a master of disruption. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well paid to get picked on, though, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> What's fascinating to me uh, when, when Joe talks about the, the barter economies and these local currencies is when I hear that, the first thing that it pops into my head is, wow, that sounds like a gift card and you can't expire gift cards. So that doesn't work online. Um, but it, it's, it's funny when you look at the legal regulatory landscape and how that has to change uh, in order to, to lay the groundwork for this changing uh, labor market. Um, if you have any sort of uh, stored value or gift card or, or even a reputation currency, any sort of currency where there's real value that can be changed out for cash or real goods, you're going to run into a raft of uh, legal regulatory issues, including are you a money services business? Do you have to go in 40 states and get money transmitter licenses? Can you do that? And if you're going to do that, you're going to have to have a multi-million dollar war chest to pull it off. And is that the environment that we want to have startups, you know, developing new technology in? It certainly benefits in incumbent companies who, um, who, who have the capital and have already gone through these processes to keep new innovative uh, technologies out. Um, but it's something that's going to have to be resolved in a big way to allow for the type of innovation that's going to have to happen. Um, not just in the payment space, which is obvious, but as non-payment companies start incorporating these currencies and even meta currencies that are going to be built out that sit on top of that. So I think that that's something that, uh, that we haven't seen enough movement in yet. Right now, assumedly, that's a U.S. scenario. And that's a U.S. scenario. Some other, you know, as you get international, there's been a little bit more uh, movement in that space. So, you know, there's the the e-money rules in the EU that are a little bit more sophisticated and uh, still there's a lot of uh, a pretty high threshold for bonding requirements there, but at least it's a bright line clear rule if you're in the EU you can play by these rules. Whereas here in the US there, there aren't any bright line rules and um, and you can talk to the folks at eGold and you know ask them how they thought that they were doing something that was fine and they almost ended up in jail. So um, Right now that does suggest that there's some real opportunity for countries that would like to forward their innovation in these areas to just in the same way as certain countries will provide a tax haven to incentivize business to come in and to open and operate there, they can incentivize these types of businesses by easing up on the rules a little bit. And, and my vote is, you know, Cayman Islands, Bermuda, someplace like that. Barbados is be brilliant. <laughs> have, you, have you seen the number of patents coming out of Barbados per capita more than the U.S.? Absolutely brilliant. That They would be the first one. I'm going to talk to them about this. <laughs> well, that's a pretty dark world, Patrick. Um, what can I do today? I mean, I'm working with people. They're working with me. We're exchanging value. We're doing things. Airplanes are leaving the ground. People are, what's the default legal structure that we are falling into? Um, and how do we manage that? 
Good well, question. so you either partner with somebody who's already gone through the process, and you know, so you've got people out there like Facebook and Facebook credits, and they're they're clearly going out and getting their money transmitter licenses now. So you can just get into the Facebook ecosystem and pay the Facebook tax, thirty percent, to use it. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> there was a developer, uh, a game developer revolt around that um, that failed. Um, unless you're Zynga, um, uh, you can do that, or you can, you know. Essentially, you just don't play in that space, right? You create a promotional point system. You do something with points that is of lesser value to users, but keeps you kind of in a closed loop environment as far as, sorry, that's a technical term, but uh, it keeps you in an environment where people aren't taking that currency outside of your system. Um, and that's a much more manageable situation right now. But unfortunately, it doesn't provide this nearly as much value to the Yeah, but we want it to come out of the system. I want my, my airplane game yeah. value to share with my condo game value. Um, how am I going to do that? Yeah, well, well right now, you're either going to partner with somebody who's going through the licensure, or you're not going to do it. Okay, <laughs> or you're, now, you know. this, now this brings up an interesting point. So you talk about closed loop systems. Uh, which brings up, you, you see a lot uh, in terms of Second Life and Linden dollars and the use of that which can be exchanged in and out for currency. In fact, I think we have somebody from Second Life here in the audience. There he is. There he is. Uh, was there a licensure process? Was there all of that to go through? Oh, for Second Life? Uh, yes. Second Life's a little bit different because the money is attached entirely to virtual objects that are in a virtual world. But yeah, these licensing issues are substantive. Um, I do think the world's going to change. We're going to get forced into different models, but, but absolutely, there's a lot of stuff to, there are a lot of licensing and regulatory issues, state by state, country by country, that you have to consider in doing all this value movement. Yeah, and I would say that, and, and the, uh, the the Linden Labs guys, I mean, they, they, they created a lot of legal precedent in this space, right? I mean, the, the Bragg case, for example, created a lot of legal precedent as far as uh, even though it never even went to trial, right? It created a lot of legal precedent um, as far as, you know, how do we view virtual property, right, under terms of use. Um, is, is If I go in and I spend $10,000 in, in Second Life to buy a house and then I violate the terms of use and they cut off my account, do they owe me $10,000, right? And if you look at the terms of use, you'd say no, but then if you're marketing to people, yes, that creates a very bad problem, right? Because uh, you can't say one thing and then do another in, in, in your terms. So right, and we're, so we're talking we're talking here about, and I think the point is, is we have to consider consider the legal and regulatory ramifications when you're dealing with things that are very important to people, like their money and their personal data online and security issues and all of these sorts of things. Um, and so let, let's let's come back to that in a little bit and talk about now um, a bit of more of these things that we're attempting to place evaluation on. So this, this intellectual, social, and creative capital, um, and, and what that really means. And so we, we're at a point where it's very common for people to have their time valued based on their skill set, their certifications, and we were talking earlier about how certain certifications were um, becoming less useful <laughs> than others, right? Because they go, oh, you and the rest of the world have one of those, right? Um, and so th there's something more that's coming into play. So l let's talk first about um, the sort of expiration of certifications. And Joe, you had a good point on this. When do they matter and when do they not? <laughs> uh, yeah, this is also to sort of Dan's point, his background in aviation and engineering. So they, they certainly matter for things that where people's lives are on the line. And, you know, the, Certain technologies don't change uh, extremely fast. Dan's point in our previous our conversation right before this was that gra gravity doesn't change. Right? So aviation uh, certification isn't, isn't going to go away. But there's things like you know, internet certification, the technology moves so quickly there that you know, certification from five years ago doesn't necessarily carry a lot of weight. So we're, we're seeing a lot in a lot of these rapidly moving industries it's a move away from certification and more towards uh, sort of social recommendation. So it's it's not so much about uh, what the piece of paper says, but what do people really say about you right now, and you know who who's sort of your quick reference and what have you done recently. 
Um, and that, that, you know, in a lot of ways, it comes back to the trust factor. It's certainly really big for, for freelancers, but what's also a really interesting data point on that, and it's certainly what, you know, what we've seen in the past few months with our own product is, it's it, where it used to be I was going to represent myself as this professional person doing these particular skills online and that was it that was my online identity was purely professional a lot of times now people actually are looking for that multi-dimensional aspect so not just is this person qualified but is this someone I'm going to get along with is this someone I really want to work with and so they'll look at the other dimensions like is this person a father or do they like the same hobbies that I do and those sort of things and I, I think that's a pretty big shift online that is partly perceptual, so people are less scared of kind of putting themselves out online. And in some ways, it's, uh, it is very much towards a new value, like people are having to do it in order to get more <coughs> discovered and, and, and appear more trustworthy. That, that's an excellent point, and, and the thought of expertise expiring, I think is really important, but there's a generational gap there. Uh, I would I would wager, and I ran into this uh, when I was at DARPA. I had a retired admiral come in to talk to me about some uh, particular technology, and was resting on his laurels from his admiralty. And I had to say, well, uh, thank you for your service, but I don't really care whose navy you used to command. What can you do for me today? Turns out, I couldn't do anything. Uh, and so. <laughs> He didn't appreciate that, by the way, but um, but that expertise, certain expertise, does expire. Whereas a pilot's license, uh, assuming you keep it up year to year, so there's a sense of refreshing, um, uh, can make a difference. Now that leads into trust, right? Because we we hire people that we trust. We want to work with people that we trust. So let's talk about what is trust, uh, and then get into how that. Uh, that spreads among networks, and this is where Connect Me is, is, is kind of fun, and yeah, I'm plugging it, but it's cool. <laughs> Check it out. So this is the first instantiation I've seen of attempting to promote the, the propagation of trust and the quantification of reputation and influence, right? Um, and so this, this is very interesting. So what comes into trust? There's certainly some amount of knowledge. But what else? So let's kind of go down the line and see what else. What do you think, Bam? Oh, me. Okay. Yeah. Trust, I, I see it um, as, as an excellent storage device for value. Um, trust is something, when you have a trusting relationship with somebody, you're storing value between each other. For It's not a very good for exchange because you can't expire some trust in order to get a sandwich or something. You know, that doesn't work. It's very good for the storage of value. And we find that in corporations a lot when, you know, the, the company will hire a, the new rock star, superstar graduate from the MIT. But everybody else doesn't trust that individual because they're going to take everything that they know and get off, go off and get the next job for twice the money. So they cut them off. And sometimes that's interpreted as um, there's something faulty with the organization and that this rock star is, is, is the one. When, in fact, it's the company, it's the, it's the people in the company who are preserving the company asset, the corporation, preserving that corporation from this individual who's just going to hop in and hop out. And we, we don't, um, so, so trust dynamics are huge. You get companies where there's an older, like Boeing has a huge gap in between the people leaving and the people <coughs> coming in, a big knowledge gap. And you want the younger people to get that knowledge. I mean, it takes, you just can't wake up and start learning how to fly to build an airplane. This is a very, you know, generations go through I mean, an aircraft development process. So at the same time, these kids are coming out with some fantastic social media tools, and then the older side are not, willing to, uh, to adopt those. But when you get both sides who are not trusting each other, you, you, you get this big gap between them. In fact, they should see each other as supply and demand. One has a supply of knowledge, and the other one has a de demand of knowledge. That means students, teachers. So instead of rating ourselves in terms of losers, winners, winners, losers, our, our whole, whole the economy is based on that. If we were to rate each other in terms of student, teacher, everybody's a student of something, everybody's a teacher of something, that's collaborative. Okay, so that's, that's, but that brings us to a point where the law is conflictive. I mean, lawyers get up and duke it up. They don't collaborate. So there's no legal structure for collaboration in that sense because everything devolves to a, to a wrestling match somewhere along the line. So. Yeah, and, and let's, let's, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sorry, well, let's, no, return, let's return to that. Okay, have, so tell us about trust, Joe. Uh, well, it's, it's certainly... Uh, it, need, it needs to be categorized, right? Someone with a really good credit score doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to want to work with them and, and vice versa. And it's also not necessarily transitive 
if I trust someone, it doesn't necessarily mean that my friends are going to trust their friends, and, and so on. The the category aspect of it is, you know, we see this everywhere online, right? I mean, there, there's so many recommendation services out there, um, and even within my my friend groups, right? Social networks are the average social graph now has gone well beyond 300, right? We're so far past Dunbar's number that it's creating this crazy cognitive load on people and they have, you know, over-connectedness syndrome essentially, right? So we're needing new ways to kind of parse this up and say, well, actually I just trust this person on the, you know, music recommendations alone or this is just food recommendations, right? So that, um, that new sort of categorical stuff, it, it, it mirrors what happens in the real social world, but I think these are sort of new trends happening online that are trying to catch up with how our brains actually function in, in the real world. All right, Patrick? Yeah, well, to, to Dan's point on, on the collaboration, um, you know, it's true, right? I'm always looking for a good fight, so I, that, that does, uh, that does come, come to the, the, the core of my thinking. Um, it, it's also true that you know the law hasn't really caught up to the idea of ad hoc collaboration, right? Uh, the example I usually use is uh, if I have a great business idea in Seattle and I have a developer in San Francisco and a product guy in Bangladesh, then we all just get together online and decide we're going to build a product and it turns out to be great. It turns out to really take off and get a ton of traction. Okay, well we never papered anything over. So now we have you know a real problem because if we were all in Washington State, we'd be considered a de facto partnership under Washington State law, but we're not. Now you've got a conflict of laws issue between California and Washington, but then you also have an international issue because you've got somebody in Bangladesh, and are they going to submit to the jurisdiction of either of those states, right? And so then you have to go back, and then you have to paper it over, and then you have the arguments and the fighting and all that because everybody's going to say, well, I put in 70% of the work, I want 70% of the company, and you're never going to find a venture capitalist who's going to back the company that's got all those issues uh, until they're put to bed. So it would be nice, and, and of course, no one's going to think about any of this stuff until you have a product that's actually worth selling in the first place, right? Um, for the most part. It, what I think would be nice is to have some sort of framework and something built in so that it's, I hesitate to say click wrap, but you know, some sort of just very simple agreement you know, where people come in and they can go to a portal or some sort of funnel so they can collaborate together and know that this is who owns what, um, this is the corporate structure, whether it's an LLC or, or a new form of structure, um, and, and that all gets tidied up uh, right from the get-go. And, and now there's a there's a great business idea for an entrepreneur out there, <laughs> but uh, right. right something simple because this this happens to me all the time. So you're approached with a potential joint venture. You think there might be some there there. You'd like to explore it. You want to take it a little further. And all you really need though is some sort of really simple agreement that says, okay, well we're going to explore this, and and if it works out, then you'll have this percent and I'll have this percent and we'll incorporated this way or whatever. But for now we're just exploring, right? It's almost a pre agreement. It's, sure, it sure. And it simple. doesn't even have to have the formality of an LLC or something where right. you're filing, it can be simply a partnership. As long as you spell out ahead of time, you know, who has what kind of stake in this business or right. or what stake somebody should have given the effort they're going to put into it, right? Exactly. Something that's uh, that's very simple and clear and and hopefully very automated, right? So they start, as, they start as trusting networks of individuals doing something, and then they have to become this legal structure. How far can that trusting network expand before it become, has to become a legal structure? I think this, is hoping, this is what I'm hoping Connect Me can solve, okay? Right. And then after that, what's the, what's the way the system works? There certainly is a game. No pressure, point. but that's a lot to solve, Joe. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Can you just take care of that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, the next, that's the next release, right? You get to, as soon as the sprint's over, you get the next 2.0. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Right, but that trust, that trust, and I want to make sure we bring this up because I was involved um, back in my W days in a project that was sort of the first to quantify and measure the propagation of trust through networks. And what was fascinating about this wasn't just that we found a way to measure trust, but that it, we found that it does not propagate in the way that you think it does at all. There, there was a sense of keeping your enemies closer, but there's also this assumption when you're doing social network analysis that um, a person or a node that is highly connected or has a high centrality is therefore highly trusted or influential. 
not the case. Uh, so right, how, think, of your, think of your Facebook network. How many people on there do you really trust? Really? <laughs> Probably not that many. <laughs> But uh, so, so it doesn't propagate. It's much more uh, point to point. Uh, there's much less transition uh, or transitivity of trust among networks. Uh, and it's very topic specific. So, you know, I, I trust you for your wine recommendations, uh, but not your movie choices. But I trust you for your movie choices and, and you for music, right? And, and so I, you get very um, pick and choose about this. Uh, and so it's, it's, we can't assume, we just have to be very careful about what we're assuming when we go down the road of measuring and analyzing these things. That's my point there. So what are the, some of the drivers of scarcity for trusts, drivers of scarcity for knowledge? We, I, I said proximity, you said bandwidth, right? Mental mm -hmm. bandwidth. Um, those are the new, like right now money is held scarce, but there are plenty of scarcities in an abundant economy. One is bandwidth, one is location, one is, is, is so forth. So the structuring of, a, of an economy, all the elements are there, all the pieces are there. It's just we have to realign them so that they can kind of, what the output of one becomes the input of another. And maybe we can see an economy form. Um, and what I'm getting at with him is contracts can solve a lot of things. Um, the right kind of contract. And who's writing these, who's, who's developing these. Well, and, and the other difficult question is here is how do you turn this into money, right? Uh, I mean, this is, this is a conference full of amazing startups, and, and that's always the number one point, right? Why do you start this business? Well, we're going to try to make some money. Well, what we're, we're, we're trying to do is we, you know, business, can't, business plans that are not viable, like the flying people in small towns, those are not viable in a CAPM model. Otherwise, the airlines wouldn't be pulling out. But when you throw in a value game, they now become viable. So there is, there is money there. It's not efficient. We're not knocking this thing out. We're learning how this works. But we are finding money in this game, and it's integral. But we need all these tools in order to pull it off. We do. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go down that road um, of what's missing. So we've identified one thing which is missing, which is a sense of legal structure for these beginning stages that's quick and easy, that may be online. What's missing in terms of technology? So let's start with Dan. Um, for us, well, we need people on the ground. We, we, we thought we could just scale this thing up, make this big virtual trip. But we've got to have people on the ground who can read data, who can look at They've got to have that background so they can see supply and demand in the data. Um, ideally, they need to see who wants to fly someplace, who wants to fly the airplane back, utilize that thing full and complete. So there's a place for the human mind in a very big way here. It's, uh, we see it as, as proximity-centric and uh, knowledge centric and the ability to change knowledge, rate of change of knowledge, rate of change of data, rate of change of information. So that's a, that's a differential equation. Um, so there's an algorithm there too. So we, we see all that, but we don't have, we, we gotta have the legal structure. We need to have the, the, the tools, the technology tools, which aren't blockaded by, you know, corporate marketing. Like uh, Facebook is great, but you can't, you can't, you just can't, um, you can't crawl it. Or, you know, there's just too much of the, of the other noise that, that always wants to reach into this thing. So we need a more pure <coughs> social network, and we need the legal structure. All right, Joe? Yeah, well, you know, one of the big ideas that's been floating around for a while, and, and you know, in the, in the past couple of years of, uh, of sort of researching this space, we, we, we've seen it shift a tremendous amount, especially within the telco space. But the, what, what's really, really kind of missing from the large-scale ecosystem when you look at uh, new value um, monetary transfer is a marketplace for data. And people have been talking about this for a long time, and the, you know, all the data is out there, essentially. Um, it's being monetized in all sorts of different ways, and there's you know, sort of a lot of press around Facebook lately on what you know, people's perception of monetizing it, essentially in bad ways. But the, the telco space has really adopted this in a big way uh, with telco 2.0 conferences and other things that have been happening. Because uh, they sit on such a huge amount of data. They have, uh, you know, they have a relationship with four billion people on the, on the planet. And they're looking for ways of, well, how, how do we sort of create this new kind of marketplace where the consumer can be cut in on some of the transactions around their data? Because if you're really going to unlock the, the, the power and the value of data, people have to be aware of what the value actually is. Selling it off on what's essentially the, you know, the black market for data right now um, doesn't, doesn't unlock the full potential of it. So I think, I think we're seeing trends towards that. And there, you know, 
we were, I was part of a couple sort of think tank processes, and a lot of the big companies were, were looking at this and, and sort of bringing their data pieces to the table and, and developed out this essentially technology stack of what it would actually take to kind of kick off this market. It's, it's a huge thing, right? You have to get practically Visa and, you know, Google and sort of everybody involved to really kick it off, but we're starting to see it happen now, sort of the, the foundations of it happening in, at, at the startup level, as well as Microsoft and others starting to, to play within the space and, and develop out some of these pipelines. The first sector that I think that's really going to take off on this is uh, the, the health data sector. There's a, there's a lot of activity happening within that space. But it's re it really comes back to this idea of like, what is the consumer's relationship with their own data, who do they trust with the data, and then how do they understand uh, where the monetary um, value flows as that data kind of moves through the ecosystem. Yeah, and it's really interesting. Um, I'm just going to take one part of that, and you know, when you look at the consumer's relationship to data, and you take Facebook, for example, which, you know, when you think of Facebook, it's like just a brilliant arbitrage game, right? Like, you get people uh, to come to your site and input information, they get opaque value back, right? They can see, you know, their ex-girlfriend from high school's pictures now, and, you know, she doesn't look so great, so that's great, now I feel better about it all, right? Um, and there's, but that, that's value, right? But it, it's opaque value. Whereas, you know, on the other side, you know, Facebook is aggregating all this data, uh, she believes, at, 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 at below its actual value and then selling it to marketers at its true value, right? So it's a pure arbitrage game and, it, and it's very well designed and it works at scale. Uh, and they hit that scale and that's, you know, wonderful for them. Um, the, where I think things need to go with that and, you know, be, before I was uh, off on my own, I was working with a company called Big Door where we were doing gamification, right? Um, and one of the goals there was to not so much incentivize people to engage with online experiences, but to reward them with a currency, reward them with something tangible and transparent for their engagement with different properties and for essentially giving us data, right? Or giving that property data. So when we were working with Major League Baseball, it was, it was you know, come, you know, watch this game day app, participate in this, and as you do it, you know, you'll get rewarded with certain virtual items, right, and trinkets. Um, and you can certainly take that to virtual currency that can be turned into uh, real rewards, uh, swag, whatever. Uh, you start running into some of the legal issues that I talked about before, so you got to keep it all like in-house. Uh, it would have been nice not to do that. Um, but I think that's going to be a key part of collecting this data, and a key part of not just getting big data, but getting the right data from people uh, is, is, is facilitating transparent value exchanges. Right? So it's okay for Facebook to, to aggregate a bunch of data and sell it at its true value. I don't think that's an issue. Um, I think that if they made it more transparent, the value exchange back to the consumer, that there'd be less of an uproar around, you know, uh, uh, how they're managing privacy issues and things like that. Right, and now that brings up the value of a person's own private data to them. So, for example, if I, I put in data on LinkedIn, I put in data on Facebook or Twitter or wherever, uh, that's being used for the marketing back to me. If I allow, um, you know, Google to track where I'm surfing, you know, what's in it for me? Right, as, as an individual consumer, right? And do I value my data uh, differently than somebody else? Right, and what's in it for you, though, is that you get these great search results for free, right? And they're fast and they're relevant okay, and they're not good. not enough, that's not enough. But, but it may not be enough, but it certainly is opaque. Right, because people look at it and they say right. it's a free service, but a it's not a more targeted ads. The ads on the side of the page may actually right. be relevant to what I'm interested in. Right. And, and you know, and, and actually, Craigslist has a really interesting feature. It's anonymous until the point of transaction. So you put yourself out there. Everybody's anonymous until somebody comes and expresses interest in the product, and then if they want to pay you in a second part, third party Nigerian cashier's check, you can elect <laughs> not to engage with them, or they want you to do something kooky with that. You can actually talk to them back and forth a few times before you you give up your identity and so forth. That gives you um, that gives you ownership. And when you have ownership, people will, will tend to the garden a little bit better, um, I think. So I, that's one feature, although you know it's not a Craigslist world, but that one feature. Is something that I'd like to see incorporated in, in the transaction of knowledge assets. Well, now that can be difficult because it's hard to have trust 
in someone when you don't know who they are, right? So Well, you get to Google, you get to look at his feature and see, okay, this guy's been trusted, now I can let them into my garden. Okay, now that's, that's different, kind of, kind of right? Now, now, here's, now here's a question for the audience out there, right? Along these lines, let's suppose you were looking for a team member to work with, and you could see their, their vouch score on Connect Me. You could see, you know, how many recommendations they have on LinkedIn. You could see their educational background, or something like that. But that, that's all you can see. You, could, you, you couldn't get a name. You couldn't get right. Would you trust it? <coughs> would, you, would you go there? Versus you have maybe the resume and the name, but you don't have the recommendations or the vouch, the number of vouches, right? Realistically, which person are you going to go with? What would Joe say? <laughs> what, would Joe, what would Joe do? <laughs> what would Joe do? Uh, but but I, I want to I know what the audience yeah, oh, okay. thinks. Which way would you go?